It's actually a really difficult talk to put together because um, there's so many <coughs> tools to for schools available. Um, and I guess if you've got the app, if, if you've got Apple devices, you may be on the App Store. 750,000 apps was the, the last sort of estimated count of apps on the App Store. It's probably more now. It goes up by several thousand every day. Um, and you know they, they're ant anticipating by I think it's um, December this year there'll be something in the region of a billion apps downloaded to um, devices a week. Now I mean that's an insane number, you know. Um, in to my mind, quite a lot of this is how you filter through that information to actually access some of the useful tools that are available. Um, one of the tools, interesting, which I'm not going to talk about, is Twitter. Um, you guys obviously haven't been in talking about Jackson. Are you all on Twitter? Do we tweet? No ish, maybe, sort of. Think about it. Um, although you do now, you're, you're on it. You, you've joined. You've joined the club. Um, but no, uh, if, if you are on Twitter, by all means follow me. Also follow Foot Squeak. Uh, make sure you hashtag things to you learn 2013 so we can get it up on the big screen. Um, but there is there's so many tools available that you can find out about. And what I wanted to do was to talk about just some of them, some of the things you can do on, on the computer that you may or may not be aware of. So I wanted to start very, very simple. And it's something which you probably have all heard about, but I just want to draw your attention to it in the context of things that Google are doing. Um, and the tool I'm going to talk very briefly about is something called Google Earth. Anyone used Google Earth before? Yeah. Heard of Google Earth? Yeah. yeah. Now, what you may not know about Google Earth is they've recently introduced some new things that you can do with it. Um, you've always been able to, let me go into, the, in, into Google Earth and actually show you. You've always been able to do simple things like search the globe. So when this comes up, I can search for, for example, CH11SL. And that's our location now. And Google will search around and it will find a new location. And here we are in Chester in the UK. And we can zoom down to, to Google Earth. Now, what I've just done is, because I went to Chester, I've chosen on one of these points. And these points are specific landmarks of pieces of information that's in the local vicinity. And Google goes away and will tell me about it. So I can tell that here in the Innovation Centre we are quite near Chester Castle. And I can get some information about that. And there's hyperlinks, so I can maybe go and link off and find some information about the River D, for example, which might be of interest. Uh, that information is coming from Wikipedia. There's several other reliable sources available. And depending on where you go, there's all of these hot, hot spots available on, on, on the Earth. Uh, if I search for something like the Grand Canyon, for example, again, we'll fly across the world. I mean, a few years ago, imagine being able to do this. You can actually choose a location, actually go and fly to it. You can see, you can see lots of more hot, hot spots around in various different ways. Um, but as I zoom into the Grand Canyon, what you actually start to see is that Google have a 3D representation of this. And if I can make it work, by tilting my iPad, I can actually start to fly through the canyon. And it's not going to... Wait, trust me, it works. You can do this on your, on your own phone. So here we go. So you actually start to, um, it's not going to be particularly clear on the screen, but you can actually start flying through the canyon, and you can zoom in on specific details that might be of particular interest. There are other things, so um, you can go into maybe the Eiffel Tower, and you can see the Eiffel Tower in real life, um, and you can actually start to appreciate what the Eiffel Tower would look like if you were standing there. You can find information about what's around it. Um, you can have hotspots of information, pieces of history about when it was built. So you can immediately see, in terms of your curriculum in your schools, you can link it into a number of key areas um, which, which might be a, a relevant. So maybe you're doing a, a history lesson and you want to find out about the Pyramids of Giza. So off you can send your children to the Pyramids of Giza. So we'll have a, a little hop over into Egypt. And in this case, there's even more information available. One, we've, we've marked specific locations. We can get photos of what might be of a particular interest. We can zoom into Giza itself. I can find the pyramid. You can actually start to see 3D representations of some of these things. Some of you might have used Google Street View, for example, as well, where Google have actually driven these cars around, actually driven down people's streets. So again, um, fantastic for children to actually appreciate where they're actually going in a 3D world, um, which again can be linked to computer programming in terms of 3D reality, virtual reality. 
Um, now, I said this was a the first tool was quite a simplistic tool, and it is, but it's actually a way in for me to talk around um, lots of other things that Google do. And this is a whole suite of apps called Google Apps. Search on the internet um, on your iPads, and you'll find all sorts of things. All of these things, without exception, are completely free. Google Earth is one of them. Draw your attention to a few other ones. Google Calendar. Don't know if anybody uses that, but there's a good example um, of that being used in schools to schedule all of the school activities, things that are going on. That can be shared with parents, shared with staff, shared with students if you want to. So huge opportunities with that. A um, couple of others to pick out. Blogger. Um, now, Mike upstairs, when you go to social media, will talk around using blogging as part of your teaching practice, which, again, um, is, is another good thing to do. You've all used YouTube. Everyone's heard of that. That's provided by Google. Um, You've got things like Google+, Plus, the social networking site, um, Pinterest, sorry, not Pinterest, um, Picasso Web. Um, all of these things, completely free tools um, that you can use simply by searching for Google, Google Apps on your, in your internet browser. So what I'd urge you to do is, following today or during today, just do a search for Google Apps, have a look around at some of the free things that Google are doing, and just start being a little bit creative about how you can use them. And if you want some ideas, come and talk to me or any of the other guys that are upstairs, and I'm sure we can give you some creative ideas for how they might be useful in, in your schools. So, moving on. Cool tool number four. This was mentioned in Steve Mellew's talk, EPUB Books, and the idea of using Book Creator on the iPad. Um, you obviously saw this morning how powerful that can be, but I want to give you another example of how this is actually being used in a primary school. So I've just got a very quick video to show you, um, which is an actual real-world example of how a primary school is using this sort of technology to consolidate learning. Just want to get the lights for me, Steve. Um, a lot of technology um, into the school um, recently, um, including iMacs and um, iPads. We wanted to prepare the children <coughs> for the 21st century and when they actually go to college and university and hit the workforce because the technology they're going to use there is going to be, it's going to be more, more advanced and we want to prepare them as, as, as early as we can so that they're ready to work and, and to carry on as, as lifelong learners. So we looked at the EPUB as um, a means of children expressing their understanding and access, accessing content. So um, we've looked at um, different type of apps that the children can use on the iPad to create um, EPUB books. And that's the way that, that the children are working at the moment. The, the, the type of book that's um, interactive, that, they, that um, embeds videos, embeds sound, embeds text, embeds um, images. So that's the way the children and the teachers um, are working at the moment. We chose ePublisher because we believe it's the content that and the style of uh, presenting, presenting children's work that we think the children will need to use in, in the future. We, we, we tried lots of different um, other options, but uh, as a school we found it really embraces um, using images, using video, using sound. As you can see, the, ch the, the children are, are happy using it and, it, and it helps, it scaffolds their learning, so it gives them um, a tool that they can help present their work in, in the best possible way. So, to make a book, you go on books and then you click the little plus and you can call it what you want and then to open your book you click it and you can add whatever you want like titles and you can put paragraphs in so I'm just going to type little letters. We believe that the children will be accessing, accessing con content that um, will be in, in digital form, in EPUB form, that we'll have the, the iBooks author and the children will be downloading the content they want to learn from, from, their, class, from, from their class teacher. So again, we're looking to prepare them for actually to make their own content using, using iBooks author and then being able to upload it and, and share it sharing from, sharing from the teacher, so it, it'll be the content the children will learn and then the children producing the content that they will share, share with the teacher. So it's a, it is a, an ongoing process. So you can see there, obviously, examples of how that's actually used with children in the classroom. Um, and I'll give you a very quick example of how we author actually works. If I go into Book Creator, um, which is the app, you can see this was the book I was creating in the last session. Um, so let's, let's extend it out. Um, we're going to create some new pages. Maybe I want to add an image in. I'm going to add an image from my camera roll. There's a picture of one of our apps that we're going to talk about in a few seconds. Um, maybe we want to add some text or some audio. So very simple, drag and drop, almost like a... Um, desktop publishing application. But what I also want to draw your attention to is the idea of you as teachers and educationalists creating content yourself and releasing this and actually publishing it onto the iBook store. 
So this is actually a way that you could potentially generate revenue either for your school or personally, um, where you can create some of your educational content, some of the things you're doing with your classes, release it publicly, sell it, give it to your school for free, let your children use it for free. Um, but it's, it's a medium for you to actually shout about the good things you're doing in your school. Another way this has been used is to actually get all of the children in the class to create a book, maybe about a topic, maybe you're doing ancient Egypt. Um, so if everybody creates their own ancient Egypt book, and then you can bring it together into one book, you can merge books together, so you then have a class book, which is class 5 Egyptology information, or class 5 Egyptology topic, which you can then use for presentation at open days or parents' evenings, um, to really shout about the good things your class is doing. In doing that, you actually create a bit of a mini enterprise where children can see they're putting some effort in, you know, uh, they, they do the research, they find the information, they put it into book format, and then other people can learn from what they're doing and potentially generate a revenue either back into the class or into the school. So huge opportunities for using, for using that, um, I believe. And again, very happy to talk to anybody about different ideas that you might have in terms of how that could be beneficial in, in your schools. Now, we've talked there about the idea of enterprise, which brings us on to... Um, my next tool, which is an app called Blueprint. Um, and this is probably an app that you haven't come across before. Um, it's on your iPad that have been given out today. Um, Blueprint is an app that allows you to prototype apps. Um, Footsqueak has, over the last 12 months, been working with numerous schools around the Northwest, getting children to develop their own apps. And here are some of our apps. Um, so we've been going into schools. Uh, this one is Egyptian Quest, for example. Um, where the children create an app related to their Egyptology project. It's not all about Egypt, I promise you. I know I've mentioned it twice. But um, the children created an app, which is called Egyptian Quest, and the idea is you have a series of puzzles. Um, in one puzzle, I put the app on the screen, the children have to put the hierarchy of Egypt um, into the pyramid. So we can go into Quest, which is here. And does anybody know ancient Egypt? What's, what's the one at the bottom of the pyramid? Any ideas? Slaves. slaves yep, yeah, well done. <coughs> um, so we've got slaves. Then who comes next? Craftsmen. Craftsmen. Then who we've got? Official. Yeah. Followed by high priests. Priest. Priest. Visors. Who's the assistant of the pharaoh? And finally the pharaoh. Once you've done that, you can then go and do a number of questions. So how old was Tutankhamun when he died? 18. When he was eighteen, when he died. What was the Egyptian sun god called? He was called Ra. Um, Egyptian rulers were pharaohs. And finally, Egyptian writing is called hieroglyphs. And in doing that, we've unlocked Tutankhamun's tomb. Now, in terms of this, this was done as, uh, by some children at Liscard Primary School, um, up on the world, um, as an end of topic um, app activity. Delamere Academy um, is now doing an app per topic for their children, where they're choosing 15 to 20 of their students at the end of every topic, working with us to develop an app. And we use Blueprint. So if I just go into Blueprint, I'll show you another example of some children's work. Send this back to the screen. We worked with New Brighton Primary School, looking at farmyard animals. And what the children actually do is, first of all, come up with the ideas related to their app. They then have to go away and do the research for the content they're going to include within it. They then need to create the graphics, create the, the various icons, um, create the buttons and actually start to, to put things together. And obviously at that stage you can start talking around human interface design with the children. What makes a good app? What makes a bad app? Why do you like to use things? Why don't you like to use things? What is it about bright colours that are better than dreary colours? Why is that visually engaging? Why is it not visually engaging? And you can really have some really interesting conversations about the sorts of apps the children like to use and the sorts of apps they don't. But then you can take it a step further. We talk about Michael Gove's programming agenda in schools, which is um, being pushed you know, in, in many different places around the curriculum. Now, within Blueprint, you can start to introduce children to the concept of event-driven programming. This is the idea that when I press a button, something happens. So I've just pushed a button on my iPad, and I've went to a question. So immediately from a child's point of view, you've initiated an action and that resulted in something happening on the screen. And the children have had to link those two activities together in Blueprint to create that effect you've just seen on the screen. So now maybe we ask a question, which is, in this case, what's a baby pony called? It's going to be a foal. So we touch that. And again, you have this, this idea of an action. And there's all sorts of other things you can do within Blueprint, um, which actually allows you to start exploring the concepts of programming. Now, it is only concepts at this stage. You, know, you, aren't, you aren't saying to a child, 
here is you know, here is ten lines of code, and this will execute, and you'll have if statements and and statements, all of these things. It's not that detailed at this stage. It's a very very basic introduction, and we've used this effectively with children as young as year three. We've used it with year five, year six students, and obviously you can vary the level of detail you go into as, as you're doing that. The crucial thing in terms of creating these apps is that the children get to follow the system's development life cycle. So you create an app using Blueprint, you do all the research, put the work into it at the outset, you then follow the process through, and the app ultimately gets released into the app store, which then gets charged at 69p. That generates a revenue which comes back into the schools, and the schools that we've worked with have generally said to the children, so you've now generated circa 70 or 80 pounds, what do you want to do with the money that you've made? So immediately you then link it back to the enterprise curriculum as well, which is a very aspirational thing to, to work with, with our children, especially in the times of financial austerity that, that we're all facing. So that's, that's Blueprint. Um, if I put my keynote back up, um, there's just a few of the um, various words that you know, teachers have sort of said it, it's helped them to actually achieve. And again, what we've actually done is in, in some ways using this app, we've been able to link it back to areas in schools where maybe they've had some difficulty. So you saw maths challenge up there. There was one particular group of year five students that had some problems with specific areas of maths. So what we did was we weren't doing maths, we were creating an app. But suddenly you can actually start to get children to think about um, different types of maths question, you know, they had to work out the answer to the questions, they had to use their maths and analytical skills to actually put that together into the app, and they weren't thinking they were doing maths because that particular class didn't like maths. So again, you've taken it to a different context with the use of IT. But then what I imagine you're all screaming is, well, that isn't really programming. How do we actually do programming in our schools? <coughs> and some of you will have seen my little, my little friend who's on the table here. Um, and I would like, very, very much like to introduce you to him. This is Mindstorm. Um, and Mindstorm is Lego. He's a Lego robot um, that I bought last week. And the reason I bought him was because I went to bed. Um, and Lego had a big stand. And um, I, I came back and I was, I was quite impressed by what they'd done in terms of programming. I thought, well, let's, let's see how we can do this. To put it in context, before I tell you about what Mindstorm does, he costs about £200. So in terms of your school budget, it's not an unaffordable option to actually get something like this into school. But what Mindstorm actually does is actually get your children to program. And I've got on my laptop here a programming interface, very much drag and drop centric. So on the left hand side I have a series of tools and maybe I want to say the first one is move. I drag that into place, I can click on that and there's a couple of parameters I can set down here which may be move forward five paces or move forward five rotations, move forward five seconds. You can then start to actually use Mindstorm in more advanced ways by thinking about, well, if something happens, do something else. So Mindstorm, on, in this model that I've built here, has a sensor on the back that detects colour. So you can put a coloured ball in front of it, and if Mindstorm sees that it's red, it will do one thing. If Mindstorm sees that it's blue, it will do something else. It's incredibly visual. You'll all heard of Raspberry Pi, um, which is being pushed into schools. So it's, again, it's not a bad thing you haven't heard of it, you know, it's, but it, it's, it's been quite widely publicised over the last 12 to 18 months about a way to introduce children to programming. The problem I have with Raspberry Pi is that you essentially type something onto the, onto the keyboard, some commands, and that does things on the screen. And to a primary school child, what's the difference to that, to Microsoft Word, where you type something on the keyboard and it appears on the screen? Okay, you're making it do things, but is, is that concept really easy to grasp? Whereas with Mindstorm, I can drag things onto my program, um, very, very simply, and again, you can take this to be as advanced as you want to be. I can then send this to Mindstorm, so I'm compiling it together, and in a second, Mindstorm's going to go. Now, this particular robot is set up, so that if it detects something in front of it, we will start too far forward, there we go, if it detects something, it will move back, it will rotate, it will then move forward, if you want to put your hand in front of it when it comes towards you. <laughs> doesn't like things being on the table. Go back. There we go. So assuming you've got a clear surface, it detects the fact there's an object in its way and responds to that. So you can see there's some not that far back. Works. Hold it in front of you. Give it a second. Don't move your hand away. There we go. It's, you need to give your hand a certain distance away from it. And again, that's all programmable within, within, within this interface. If you want to have a go at programming in LEGO Mindstorm, um, we'll make that available at lunchtime and you're very welcome to, to have a play with it. Incredibly simple to do and incredibly simple for children to actually see how their program is actually operating in real life. And I think is, is an affordable alternative to 
you know, to actually introduce programming into schools, it, it, it's not too bad. Even the Raspberry Pi, which retails at maybe £20, by the time you've bought all the peripherals that sort of go around it, £20 is probably a bit of a, a, bit of a red herring anyway, to some extent. So, that's programming in schools. Um, final tool I want to talk to you about in the last 10 to 15 minutes that I've got um, is an app that Footscree have developed in conjunction with a group of schools called Innovated. And the app is called QSI. And what I want to do is just show you a very quick video of one of our heads talking around what this has done for his school. <coughs> Hi, I'm Gary Cunningham. I'm head teacher of Oakwood Avenue Community Primary School in Warrington, Cheshire. I'm one of six head teachers in a group called the Innovative Group. We're a group of heads looking at innovative ways to develop teaching and learning and also leadership. A common issue we've, we've got as head teachers is the school self evaluation. Uh, keeping up to the CEF and adding evidence to the CEF is a constant issue for all of us. But equally, we all had access to an iPhone, so we're look, looking to develop an app. So we developed something called QSI, uh, Quality School Inspection. It allows us to gather and organise evidence on a daily basis. Anything, pupil comments, you can take video, you can take photographs, you can record audio, and you can talk to the pupils about their work. You can record children's work at the outset and at the end of the process, so that you can see the progress that the children have made. It also allows us to record those magic moments with the children where they've got that real sense of achievement. The beauty of it is we can also pass this on to our members of our SLT, so not only is it my opinion or my evidence, it's eight people's evidence. You need to collate, organise and arrange this evidence, so we've developed something called QSI Online, where you can use any desktop computer and you can organise it and illustrate your school in the best, best light. It also allows governors to read this, the governors are up to speed at all times with regard to the school self-evaluation. So the SEP itself then becomes that constantly evolving document that, that every head teacher would like. The beauty of all this, the annual cost is less than one day supply cover. So it's something I am using, it's something I will continue to use and it's something that I would recommend to others. So I just want to spend a few moments and actually take you into QSI and show you um, what it actually does and how it actually works. Um, I'm just going to pop my phone up on the screen. Um, this is QSI. You can see I've set up ULEARN School. Um, I've made a couple of deliberate mistakes there. Um, I believe that our school is probably going to be an outstanding school, so we'll set our grade to be outstanding. And um, then I can go into each area of, of, the, of the school's offset, so maybe achievement, quality of teaching, leadership management, behaviour safety, and I can create evidence. So the first group this morning, um, they created a group photo um, that they thought would be of interest to support the evidence of how they are achieving in their school. So what I'm going to do is add a photo to QSI. Actually, I'll give the title first, so we're going to call it uh, Group 2 Photo. I'm going to take a photo of you all, smile and be happy. And we're going to use that within QSI. So that photo now gets added to, to, the QSI, to the QSI app, and I can add some text around it. So maybe I can say, um, this is a photo of a red group. And I can add that into my app. Um, so that evidence is now stored. It's tagged to the time that it was added into the, in, into the system. Um, I can also do some other interesting things. I can go in and read what Ofsted require in the, in the area of achievement. So I can read what it requires to be outstanding in achievement according to Ofsted, what it is to be good, um, I hope nobody does require improvement, or, or what would actually class you as an inadequate school. Um, you can also go and you can actually record inspection targets that are related to what you're doing in school. So in this case we have a target, must do more work. Um, you can add some detail to that. You can also add evidence and you can say, is that complete? Well, that's probably not complete at the moment because we must, we must do some more work. Um, so we add that again into, in, into our app. Now, the problem with this is, it's all on my phone. I can download it from the App Store, it's £2.99, anybody can get it, it's not a problem. Um, but as the head teacher, I've got that on my phone, and I guess my problem is I probably want it 
on more than just my phone. I want other people in my school to be collecting evidence. So maybe I want all of my senior leadership team to have that. Well, that's fine. We've now got four or five people's evidence all on different phones. How does that help me in terms of offset? The answer is it doesn't. Unless you use something called a QSI subscription, QSI Online, which is what Gary was talking about in the video. I'm going to force this to sync. It actually syncs every time you start the app automatically. Um, but in doing this, what I'm doing is I'm sending all of the evidence that we currently have in our app up onto the cloud and storing it in a secure online space. And I'm now going to go back to my iPad and I'm going to take you into QSI Online. Blueprint, that's QSI Online. So here we are on the QSI website, um, and this is where you get access to the QSI portal. If we go to portal and I log in, um, we are, I've got a demo account set up. We'll log in. And once you're logged in, we obviously add the piece of evidence, so we'll go into evidence. You can see here I've actually got multiple settings set up or multiple schools created within the app. Now obviously that's like you use the app to test and to demonstrate to people. In your school though, you may only have one. Or oh, some primary schools we've been working with have actually now set up different settings for different areas of the school. So they've got phase one, phase two, and each phase leader is responsible for maintaining their own list of evidence which then comes back into the head teacher's central QSI online portal. So if I look at you learn school, which is our one down here, we can view the evidence, and we can see this is the evidence that we've added into the app, and we can see we've had group photos before, but this is group two's photo. We can view that evidence online, and I can access your photo, which will load up. So that's the photo we just took a few moments ago, and the text that we put in. Um, at this stage, as the head teacher, or as the person with access to QSI <coughs> online, I can edit the text. I can start adding new things in. Um, I can change it, I can modify it to, to suit what I actually want to reflect in terms of my school self-evaluation. When I save that, it will send it back to my phone. But more than that, it won't just send it back to my phone, it will send it back to the phones of everybody who is linked to QSI Online. So if you have a QSI Online portal, you have the same evidence on everybody's phone. So everybody can access all of the evidence within the school. One of the questions this morning was, does it have to be on everybody's phone? And no, it's not. If that's a specific requirement that you have, come and talk to us and we'll, we'll set it up so it's actually specific to your school so that it doesn't have to be sent back up to, to everybody's phone if that's the way you want it to work. Um, I mean, obviously, read things like your, your targets. Um, you can read your uh, specific descriptions of how you're achieving your, uh, your different aims within the school. Um, if you manage the subscription, you actually have the ability to create multiple online users here. So again, um, entirely up to you as a school, you may only have one user being the head teacher, maybe you and your deputy might have a log on to, to the system. Or what some schools have done is they've <coughs> created a read-only account which is accessible by their chair of governance. So again, very important that the chair of governance has access to your school self-evaluation into the work the school's doing. So the chair of governance can log on online, not via the app, and they can actually read about what's in, what's in those documents, and they can obviously provide comment and feedback into the school so you can see how you're engaging your governing body in the work that you're doing. Um, a couple of other key questions we've been asked about this is with regard to safeguarding. If we're saying, you know, take your phone into the classroom, that's a personal device potentially if the school hasn't provided an iPad or an iPhone into the school, how do we get over that? Because obviously we don't want our teachers to be storing photos of our children on our phones and taking them away. Well, that's very simple. Um, first of all, when you take a photo with QSI, it's only stored in QSI. It's not stored on the teacher's phone. However, the teacher can still access the evidence, but via the subscription area here, you have this magic button called Remove Access. So let's say that you have a teacher who has logged on to the, the system, um, they're, they're adding evidence to the school set, but there's a disciplinary issue, and suddenly you need to remove them from school and limit their access to that information. Simply log into QSI, press the Remove Access button, and immediately all of the information that the teacher had on their phone related to your school self-evaluation will be erased. But more than that, any information they've contributed to the school self-evaluation will be retained. So that's still stored within your QSI, that's your ownership, it belongs to your school, you can still access it, but you re removed access from the teacher who's been adding that evidence, and therefore removed, removed the issue. And the fact that there's actually no nothing stored on the user's phone specifically, <coughs> um, again, mitigates the safeguarding issue somewhat. Um, if you still have an issue with regard to safeguarding, provide an iPod Touch to your teachers. It's a very affordable option to actually give teachers a device in the classroom. It costs somewhere circa £100 per device. And again, that would mean you that had a school device that was collecting this evidence in, in the school. 
And all of that depends on how many people you actually want to be collecting the evidence. Is it something you want every teacher to be doing, or is there a specific subset of people in your school of trustworthy individuals who are responsible for collecting this? Some other uses that you might you know, be interested in looking at is the idea of using this for uh, your school staff CPD or professional development or as part of their annual appraisal process. So actually getting staff to record evidence on their phones of their good teaching practice so that they can evidence what they're doing with their children and how they're meeting the specific Ofsted criteria. So again, there's ways that can be used and fil filtered in to the annual appraisal process um, that, that the, the school is doing. Now I'm very interested to talk to any school that's interested in developing further down that route. I see there's a huge opportunity for us to go into with, with that sort of development. Do you have a question? No, no sorry. sorry. <laughs> okay. no. So that's, that's related to QSI. QSI is on all of your iPads today. Please feel free to have a look um, and, and see if there's a benefit. And as I say, it's £2.99 from the App Store. So if there is any interest, download it and have a look at it. QSI online costs circa 100 quid. Um, and gives you access to all of these online tools. Also able to report from it as well, so you can produce PDF reports of all that evidence to feed into your normal school documents and things. So, that is essentially the end of my whistle-stop tour of cool tools for schools. Um, and as I said at the start, it is very difficult to come up with um, you know, lots and lots of tools that, that can be used, because there's so many out there that you might want to use. Um, the ones we've used, I'll put them on the screen, just there, so you can see what they are, in case you do want to look at them. Very happy to talk about any of these, and also to talk about lots of other things you can do with the iPads and, and um, iOS mobile devices that you might be interested in doing within your schools. I'm obviously around over lunchtime, around for the rest of the day. Please feel free to grab me. Um, but in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to ask if there's any questions, and um, if you'd like to have a play with some of the tools in the last couple of minutes you have, feel free to get them up on your iPads, and I'll point out some of the features. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. No worries at all. Um, from here, we're going back into the main conference theatre for the best of bet. So um, we're going to do that just before lunchtime. So um, you know, obviously ask, ask me questions, grab me to, to see what we want to do. Um, but if you if you finished, we can then filter out of the room and go back upstairs into, into the main conference room. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.